Hi, well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this is today's community conversation. It's our civic health checkup, the state of election reform in New Jersey. And I am joined today by League of Women Voters of New Jersey democracy policy analyst, Philip Hensley, who's going to uh, break down some information about a recent slate of election reform bills that has passed in New Jersey and uh, what you and other voters need to know as we head into the midterm elections in the coming months. Uh, before we begin, I do just want to remind people that this event is being recorded and the recording will be available uh, on our YouTube page afterwards. Uh, so if you do uh, unmute or ask any questions, uh, please just remember to um, not uh, do anything inappropriate or use uh, any inappropriate language uh, as we will be using this for future reference. And uh, if you have any questions uh, for Philip, we'll be able to either uh, have you unmute and ask directly, or uh, you can also put your questions in the chat and, uh, and we will answer them uh, as we have the chance. I think the plan is for Philip to do his presentation and uh, we'll hold Q&A for the end, but please uh, share your questions as they come up. And if it's appropriate to, to interrupt in the middle of the presentation, we'll do so. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us today and uh, very happy to turn things over to you, Philip. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, thanks for the invitation. Happy to be with y'all and talk about election reform in New Jersey. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. So uh, this afternoon, I'm going to be talking about, as Jeff mentioned, um, a slate of uh, election bills that were passed uh, and signed into law recently here in New Jersey that affect um, how our elections will be run, um, and just some general information uh, that voters should know um, about get, being ready uh, for this election. Just briefly before I get started about the League of Women Voters of New Jersey, um, we encourage informed and active participation in government and work to increase understanding of major public policy issues. Um, the League is proud to be nonpartisan, so we don't support or oppose candidates or political parties at any level of government, but we always work on vital issues of concern to members in the public, advocating in particular uh, for reforms that strengthen our democracy, that make it more inclusive, broader, um, and keeping with our 100-year history. So let's get into it. What are these election laws that we're going to be talking about today? There are five of them. Um, Assembly bills, um, I'm going to be referring to them by the assembly bill number just for convenience, 3817, 3819, 3820, 3822, 3823. Um, and they do a number of things. They have changes to how polling places are set up and ballot privacy sleeves. They affect different deadlines um, that will be relevant to voters and to election administration. They make lots of changes to uh, vote by mail procedures and they also are going to make changes that particularly affect unaffiliated voters with respect to vote by mail. And then they make other changes having to do with voter roll maintenance and pre-canvassing of ballots. So we'll get into all of that in greater depth. But first I wanna talk a little bit about where did these bills come from? You know, what, what motivated this? Um, and being part of the conversation, we heard, you know, there are many different concerns that led to this. Um, legislators were concerned maybe about two things in particular. The first was the timeliness of reporting of election results. Um, going back to uh, the election last year, um, waiting a few days for final results to be tabulated. Um, finally, there was also the concern relating to voter confidence in the election system, something which is vitally important for people to understand um, the security of the voting system, all of the measures that are put in place that protect your vote and the security of the system, because there's lots of unfounded conspiracy theorizing out there. And so reforms that can be put in place to allay um, unfounded fears about election security. Um, attempts were made by the legislature to make these bills, you know, bipartisan. And I think the, the thought was, you know, we're seeing election bills being moved in other parts of the country that aren't always bipartisan. 
an, an attempt was made um, by legislators in New Jersey uh, to, to pass some bipartisan legislation in elections here. Um, unfortunately, however, from our perspective as the league, some changes were suggested which would have made it harder to vote, um, at least in some circumstances. Um, that what, what, what have, for purposes of maybe making election results more uh, returned earlier, what have shortened certain deadlines. Not all of these changes were ultimately passed into law, though. So that is a good thing. Um, and, and, and we'll get into what those changes were and would have been. Um, third, these laws, uh, just to get the timeline um, straight for everybody, these laws were passed in the legislature in late June and signed into law by Governor Murphy, July 28. Um, during that period of you know spring and into the summer, the League of Women Voters of New Jersey and other advocates um, in New Jersey worked to try to improve these bills. We lobbied, we testified as they moved to the legislature uh, this spring and summer. So let's start with Assembly Bill 3817, focused on voter privacy and making some other changes. What does this bill do? So it includes additional requirements to protect voter privacy, including privacy screens or shields. It says that each voting booth shall have uh, privacy screens and shields to protect the voters' privacy. I think in our discussions with um, election administrators, uh, this is you know the, the practice fairly consistently already, but it's codifying something um, in, in state law. Um, in addition, uh, and, and this is um, a change, at least in, in some parts, the state each booth shall contain privacy sleeves or folders into which the voter may insert their voted ballot. So um, in places where you're filling out a hand-marked paper ballot and then bringing that to uh, a tabulation machine, for example, um, there have been um, complaints in, in some parts of the state that, you know, if that ballot isn't shielded in some way, isn't in a sleeve or something, then, you know, someone could theoretically, you know, see how you voted, that they could, they could see your paper ballot and how it was marked. Uh, and, and so this change was meant to address that concern. You know, if you have a privacy sleeve, you can put your ballot in uh, within the privacy of the voting with protect the privacy of your vote. Um, that is a change uh, that we think is positive. Um, in addition, this bill does a couple other things. Uh, some of them are a little wonky. You'll, you'll notice that's a theme maybe through this discussion. Some, some of these are a little bit wonky changes. Um, it changes the tabulation, how voters are tabulated um, for vote by mail purposes. And now those vote by mail votes are tabulated um, by precinct. What does that mean? Uh, that basically means that um, when the election results are reported for a particular county or town, Currently, the, all of the vote by mail ballots are reported separately from all the other results, right? They're not reported um, in, oh, this was from this particular district in this particular town. They're just reported generally. And so that makes it harder to know, for example, um, when you're assessing voting patterns, exactly what the turnout rate was in every single part of a district. And this would change that. Um, and there are protections included to make sure that no one's vote is inadvertently revealed, right? Um, if there was only one person who voted, um, that is not going to be uh, revealed. Um, this is a pretty extensive bill, 3817, so it has a few other changes I'm going to get into. Um, voters may declare a party affiliation or change the party affiliation using the online voter registration system. So this is a good change. Um, um, again, it's, it's to some extent uh, codifying what the Secretary of State was already implementing, but um, you can change and declare your party affiliation, not just through a party affiliation declaration form, you can do it online, the way, same way you register to vote. And starting in 2026, voters will be able to apply for a mail-in ballot when completing an online voter registration form. You don't have to, you won't have to complete a separate paper form. Uh, and that's also a good change. We think that um, mail-in voting has been a great thing for many voters, making voting more accessible, more convenient. Um, people are much more used to going online and registering anyway. So being able to apply for a mail-in ballot online is a good thing. Um, I will note, originally this was supposed to be implemented you know, right away. Um, it was delayed um, in this legislation ultimately until 2026 uh, because of you know, technical and concerns about making sure that uh, the state is ready to implement it. Um, but we are hopeful that this will be ultimately implemented and will be a good and convenient thing for voters. So stay tuned. Um, 
finally, 3817 makes some changes. Voters will not be able to complete a change of residence notice online starting next year. Um, I, I'm a typo there. Voters will be able to complete a change of residence notice online. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, when you move within a district and a county or move from a county to county, um, you can currently you know, send a change of residence notice and then your voter registration gets updated. Um, this will allow you to do it online as well. Next bill was Assembly Bill 3819. Um, and this is what, the first of uh, a few bills that makes extensive changes to how, how vote by mail works in New Jersey. You have this big increase in the use of vote by mail uh, with the pandemic in 2020, uh, and the legislature is still working through uh, changes and uh, refinements to that process. This bill would remove you from the permanent vote by mail list if you fail to vote by mail in four consecutive years, starting from 2020. The idea being, if you're not using the ballot, if you're not voting by mail, then we don't want extraneous ballots out there um, to continue to be sent to an address maybe that you're not using or to someone who's stopped voting by mail or stopped voting entirely. Um, it's very important to note that just Sorry, because, Philip? yes. Sorry, just a quick question for clarification, just to make sure. Um, for the uh, removal from the the vote by mail rules, they need to. It's it's four consecutive years of not voting, or four consecutive elections. That's right. Um, it's 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 years. Um, as as the legislation was drafted earlier on, it was it, it was based on like you know two election cycles or or election cycles. It it. it it was the final version was a four consecutive years, right? So you sign Thanks. up, you're on the permanent vote by mail list. Great qu question to clarify. Yeah. Um, currently, if you sign up for the permanent vote by mail list, you get a ballot for every election forever. And this would just take you off if you don't vote by mail for four consecutive years. Um, you can still vote as normal. You can still go and, and this doesn't remove you from the voting rolls. You know, you're still entitled to go vote um, in person or by mail, you just have to request it. Okay. Um, and this bill also makes a $5 million appropriation for voter education. So if you are on the permanent vote by mail list, um, the county boards of elections will uh, hopefully be notifying you that this change is in effect. And that if you don't vote uh, by mail, then after four years, uh, you'll be getting your vote by mail ballot anymore. So we're glad that there's this appropriation made because when you're making changes, it's important to notify voters. Next bill, uh, A3820. Um, this is a change for unaffiliated voters receiving mail-in ballots during the primary. So more, more mail ballot changes. So currently, unaffiliated voters on the permanent vote by mail list get sent a package that has ballots for both major parties. And the instructions in the packet say you're unaffiliated. You have to vote to vote in a primary. You have to choose to affiliate with a party. Please select one ballot, vote it, and return it if you choose to vote. This bill would say that if you're on the permanent vote by mail list and you're an unaffiliated voter, you will no longer be sent a ballot in the primary. Instead, the county is going to send you a political party affiliation declaration form and say, here are the instructions. First, affiliate. And then we'll send you the ballot for the party for which you declare. Um, the rationale for this is um, we've been told, you know, some election officials, sometimes people get confused and they actually fill out both ballots and then neither of them count, um, which isn't good. Um, but ultimately, you know, the, the league and other organizations were, were concerned about this just because it creates an unequal standard, right? You know, because the reality is that you can still affiliate to vote by mail, um, you can still vote in person. You're, right. You're an unaffiliated voter, you can show up on the day of the election and choose to affiliate that day and then vote on the machine that day, right? Uh, but if you're voting by mail, as an unaffiliated voter, you have this extra hurdle. So we didn't think that was entirely fair. So we were um, arguing against this legislation on that basis. But it was passed into law, it was signed into law. So if you're an unaffiliated voter and you wanna vote in a primary, just know you're not going to be getting your vote by mail ballot by default. 
One other change in this piece of legislation was that uh, delivery envelopes shall not include any indication of party affiliation, which seems like common sense. Uh, next bill, uh, the fourth of our fifth five bills, uh, Assembly Bill 3822. Um, originally was a, a, a bigger bill and it was whittled down over the process. Um, now the primary thing that it does has to do with pre-canvassing. Now, what is pre-canvassing? That's for election officials, um, how and when they can start processing the mail-in ballots that they receive. So county boards may begin canvassing, so opening, counting, mail-in ballots five days prior to the election. However, no tally or tabulation shall occur prior to the opening of polls on election day. And any leaks, unauthorized leaks of information about ballot counts um, is a crime. The idea behind this is, you know, and we um, understand the, the rationale, you know, some counties have very high volume of vote by mail, right? Uh, big increase in the pandemic in vote by mail volumes. And especially in a presidential election year, that volume is difficult to process in a timely way um, if they are only allowed to start opening and, and uh, canvassing the ballots day of. So this change was made to give them up to five days. Um, in addition, this bill makes a couple other changes. You know, county boards of elections can establish their schedules for retrieving ballots from drop boxes. Um, and if a voter changes a party affiliation at the Motor Vehicle Commission, you're going to renew your license. You get the screen that pops up. You may maybe hit the button to affiliate with a party. You shall be sent a confirmation notice of your political party change. Um, there have been some concern that sometimes people go, they're updating their license, they change their party inadvertently because the screen is messed up, uh, and then they show up on election day and then they can't vote. Um, you're going to be sent a confirmation notice if you change your, your party affiliation that way. Last bill, uh, but not least, um, Assembly Bill 3823. This makes some changes to voter roll maintenance. So during the two months prior to an election, uh, each municipal health officer shall update the county every two weeks with the identities of individuals who have died during those two weeks so that they may be re removed from voter rolls. Sometimes we hear you know, conspiracy theories about um, voter roll maintenance based on the fact that there are people who are dead who are still on the voter rolls. They're not voting, um, but people point out, oh, there are dead people on the voter rolls. Why is that? Well, it's because we need a process to remove them. There is an existing process. This would, instead of having it be you know, a monthly update, but increase the level of update to county officials to remove people who've died from the voter rolls who are there incorrectly. Um, perfectly fine as it is. Um, our concern with this legislation, however, is that there's no sort of fail safe provision. So um, if you're removed inadvertently, you know, Maybe, you know, uh, father and a son situation, same name, someone's removed by accident, accidents happen. Um, there's no guarantee that you'll be able to re-register because the registration deadline is still 21 days prior to the election. And there's no guarantee you'll be able to vote if you're removed inadvertently, um, which is why the league and other advocates have been pushing strongly for same day voter registration. So that if there is any issue that comes up with this, people who are still entitled to vote are able to vote. Um, instructional sessions are also changed for um, election board members in this legislation. Um, but speaking of same day voter registration, uh, we'll get to that in the next slide and we to talk a little bit about some of the bills that are coming down the pike. Um, first though, I'm gonna talk, I've referenced already some of the things that were not in these bills. I think it's interesting and relevant to know um, how change to the legislation happened over the course of, of these few months. What's not in these bills? Uh, one, a reporting requirement. So some earlier versions of the legislation uh, required close to real-time reporting of unofficial results. So the public would know how many ballots remain to be counted by ballot type. You know, you can go onto the county election website and see, oh, they've counted 45%, but they still need to count, you know, 90% of the in-person vote. They counted all of the, the mail vote, for example. This is a transparency measure, which, again, the idea would be to increase voter confidence in how the 
process is managed. Unfortunately, this reporting requirement was removed at the last minute. Um, you don't exactly know why. Um, hopefully it comes back in the future. Um, other changes that were in, the, in these bills that ultimately did not make it into law. Originally, these bills included changes to deadlines for receipt of mail ballots and changes to the deadlines for curing a defect with a mail-in ballot. So currently, um, the deadline for the county to receive your voted mail-in ballot and for it to count is six days after the close of polls, no, 144 hours. Uh, there would have been a change in some earlier versions of this bill to roll that back to only three days. Um, we were concerned about that. That means people who had validly cast a ballot, validly put it in the mail by election day, maybe wouldn't get it counted because it would have showed up too late. Um, there are delays, USPS, other things outside of a voter's control. Um, and so we testified against that change and fortunately it was removed. Um, other proposals in legislation would have changed the deadline for curing a ballot defect. Um, the vote by mail process involves you know, signature verification, um, but if they can't match your signature, you, send, you get sent a cure letter and you have an opportunity to go and fix uh, whatever the defect might be in your vote by mail ballot. Um, the deadline for, to do that would have been changed to nine days after the election as opposed to currently it's tied to certification for eight hours prior to certification. Um, that would have resulted in less time for voters to cure defects. Also, um, not a good thing that was taken out of the bill. So fortunately, this shows um, some provisions that would have been bad for voters were removed um, through advocacy and that, you know, we are able to, to make a difference on these bills and ensure that you know, good things are kept in and, and we can avoid some of the problems um, that would have made it harder to vote. I mentioned same day voter registration already in connection with the, the voter list maintenance bill. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about two pieces of legislation um, that may be coming down the pike. You know, we've been advocating for same day voter registration as a fix um, for situations just like that and for all sorts of situations where voters um, otherwise are not able to vote. Young voters, same day voter registration increases turnout. Um, and New Jersey needs same day voter registration. So um, we have been advocating um, to pass it. Um, Assembly Bill 1966, Senate Bill 247. And we are hopeful um, that it will uh, be considered. Another bill that I want to flag for people that's coming down the pike is a campaign finance bill. So um, Back, uh, back in June, back in June 16, in the middle of all of this discussion about all these election bills, um, the Senate dropped a campaign finance bill um, called a transparency bill um, and rushed it through committee um, in both houses to be voted on, you know, just 11 days later on June 27th, but it was pulled at the last minute. Uh, and we were very concerned about this bill, and I'll tell you why. Uh, it would do a few things. Um, first, it would have doubled campaign finance limits. So currently there's a maximum number that you can give to a candidate or a party. Uh, it's would have doubled all of those limits. So currently you can give up to $37,000 to a county political party. If you have that you know, change in your pocket. Uh, it would have gone up to $74,000 to a county political party. Same for individual candidate donations, state party donations. Uh, perhaps even more concerning, um, the bill would have gutted current pay to play law and repealed all local pay to play ordinances. So currently New Jersey has a pay to play law, which limits when contractors who receive government contracts can give contributions, um, capping them at you know, de minimis you know, $250 levels um, to avoid the corruption um, that can come through um, government contracting, especially the state and at the local level. Um, now this bill would have changed that by saying, now, if you have a contract, you can't give to the individual candidate who, or you know, elected official who, who gave you the contract, but you can give to the political party, say the political party committee in that town or the political party committee in that county, um, which is where all the money gets funneled anyway. And so that's a big loophole that would, would have been opened up for local contractors. 
um, the government contractors to funnel money into the political system. We're very concerned about that. And in addition, this bill would have repealed all local pay to play ordinances. Um, so lots of cities and counties have passed their own pay, pay to play ordinances. Sometimes they are uh, tougher than state law. Um, this bill would have changed it so that state law now is the ceiling. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't be tougher than state law at all. Um, and that was a concern too. Um, finally, the bill does have some transparency provisions. In particular, it has reporting provisions for, for, for dark money campaign spending. Um, right now, you create a not-for-profit that wants to spend some money on uh, ads 30 days, 60 days before an election targeting a candidate for office. Um, and it's a, you know, uh, it can be a dark money group. It can be a nonprofit incorporated, not a political PAC, and it doesn't have to report as contributors. Uh, that's obviously a big problem. This would have created some reporting for that up to $7,500. The good thing, but other states have gone further, right? They've created tougher transparency provisions. That means that, you know, all the dark money um, that's sloshing around in the system trying to influence politics actually does get disclosed. And so we would advocate for tougher uh, provisions to ensure that um, as much of that dark money gets disclosed as possible that's influencing our elections. Um, finally, so Senators Skitari and Arojo co-sponsored this legislation, the, the leaders in the state Senate. Um, it was pulled. And however, Senator Skitari says it will be reintroduced in the fall, which is why I have it here under future legislation. Um, we do expect this will come back and we'll be advocating um, for reforms, for changes so that it actually is a transparency bill and, and it doesn't do some of these things that we object to. So that covers what's been passed, maybe some future legislation. Uh, now I'm gonna run through um, just quickly some, some general information about the 2022 election. I think most people here will already know, but I do think it's important just to cover the basics, um, how, when to register to vote. Um, basics, can register to vote if you're a US citizen, 17 years old, with the understanding you may not vote before your 18th birthday, been a resident of your New Jersey County 30 days before the election, are not currently serving a sentence of incarceration, which means that individuals on probation or parole are eligible to register to vote. Um, the deadline to register to vote for this general election is October 18th, 2022. I've talked about vote by mail already, how the laws have changed around vote by mail. Um, here are the deadlines to vote by mail. So if you're not already on the permanent vote by mail list, you can apply to receive your vote by mail ballot. Application must be received by your county clerk by November 1st, 2022. You can also apply in person. And the deadline for that is November 7th, 2022, 3 p.m. There are a few different ways to return your vote by mail ballot. This may seem uh, simple, but um, Worth stating, all ballots returned through the mail must be postmarked by November 8th and received on or before November 14th. You can also drop them in a drop box. Um, ballots must be returned by 8 p.m. on election day um, if you're dropping them into a drop box. And finally, you can just drop off a mail in ballot in person to your county board of elections office by 8 p.m. on election day. And lots of avenues to get that vote by mail ballot candidate. In addition, you can also go on the Secretary of State's website and track the progress of your ballot with the Ballot Tracker app. Um, I know this has been something that's helped a lot of people who are concerned. You know, was my ballot received and counted? Um, so you have to go in, set up a voter record account, um, but it's uh, relatively easy and straightforward, and you, you can track your ballot to make sure it's uh, received. So ballot rejection. So there are some common reasons um, for mail-in ballots to be rejected. Uh, ballot received late after those six days, missing a certificate, signature mismatch, or of course, if you fail to enclose your ballot. Um, all of these can be avoided or fixed. It's important just to review a quick uh, checklist before you send that off, make sure certificate's included, signature uh, is completed, and of course the ballot is in the envelope. Um, the deadline, if there is uh, something wrong with the ballot, um, you'll be sent the cure letter to cure any defect. Like I said before, the deadline to receive your ballot cure form is 48 hours prior to election certification. So that date um, is subject to change because 
the election certification deadline can change pursuant to, you know, either local provisions or if there's a lawsuit, right, pushing back the certification deadline. Um, finally, I'm going to talk about third way to vote besides in person and vote by mail is early voting. Um, early voting um, is new in New Jersey, so people are just learning about it, just finding out about how to, how to do it, but it's easy and convenient. Um, everyone I've talked to who's done it this year has been uh, very pleased with the process. The early voting dates are Saturday, October 29th to Sunday, November 6th this year. Early voting polling locations will be open from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. on weekdays and Saturdays, and 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Sundays. So you can vote in person on a voting machine in your county if voting on election day is less convenient. Um, you can find your polling location at vote.nj.gov. Polls open on election day from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. To find out more about your candidates, uh, the League of Women Voters of New Jersey also operates vote411.org. Um, this is dependent on candidates responding to uh, the questionnaire that we send them, but you can find out what candidates and ballot questions will be on your ballot and some information, some more information about them if they have completed the questionnaire. Finally, here's a little list of deadlines, voter registration deadline, October 18th to the vote by mail deadlines. I'm gonna leave this up for people who might be viewing this um, later, uh, all in one place, quick, quick and easy way to check all the deadlines that might be applicable, make sure you vote and get your ballot in time. And that's it for my presentation. So and I'm gonna pause um, for any questions folks might have. And um, thanks again for the opportunity. Thanks so much, Philip. Uh, it was a really informative and, uh, and detailed presentation. I really appreciate uh, you taking the opportunity to share all that information with us. And, and thank you uh, to you and to the League for all the work and the advocacy you do uh, to make sure that uh, our democracy remains accessible uh, to all people and, uh, and that we further access to the vote and the right to vote uh, for folks in New Jersey. Um, so uh, if we have any questions uh, for Philip, feel free to uh, raise your Zoom hand and we'll call on you to unmute. Uh, or if you'd rather not be uh, on the camera or speaking, you can type your question into the chat and we'll address it as well. Um, while we are uh, waiting to see if other people have questions, I did have a couple of things I wanted to follow up on. Uh, Philip, uh, one, and I don't know if you have this information offhand, so I apologize if I'm putting you on the spot. Maybe it's just a web link people can go to, but I'm wondering for people who are interested in serving as a poll worker, um, how can people go about to uh, apply for that post? Yes, so um, you're you're right. I, I, I don't have the link offhand, <laughs> but, um, Yesterday, I believe, was uh, uh, National uh, Poll Worker Recruitment Day. And in general, uh, we recommend that folks reach out to uh, the, the, the county um, boards, of boards of elections. Reach um, out to the county board of election. Yeah, um, to find out. Um, there's also a board worker application form, I believe, on the uh, uh, Division of Elections Department of State website. Um, we can include that link maybe um, in, in a follow-up. I don't have it handy, um, but I, I, I can say that um, the the recent not, not not any of these bills that we just passed um, when we're talking about, but the um, the the state budget increased poll worker pay to three hundred dollars a day, right? Because there is a poll worker shortage. Um, so sign up. You can. Earn three hundred dollars a day, support our democracy. Um, kind of your county election officials or go to that form on the Department of State website. I think if you search around, you'll be able to find it. Um, and that's something that we encourage everyone to do. Thanks. I'm actually doing a quick Google search right now to see if I can find the link uh, so that we could include that. You said you think it's on the Division of Elections page. Yes. Um, 
I believe so. Here, actually, I think I might have it. I see general information. Uh, let's see. Be a poll worker. It is there uh, on nj.gov uh, backslash state backslash elections. Uh, if you do the drop down menu uh, for New Jersey voter information portal, there is a link. You've got to scroll down pretty far, uh, but there is an option for be a poll worker. And I'm going to share that uh, in the chat right now. And I'll also put it uh, in the Facebook uh, link for anybody watching on Facebook. And so if uh, being a poll worker is something uh, that you're interested in doing, oh, it looks like you found it for our chat already, Phil. All right, thanks. Uh, if being a poll worker is something you're doing, you know, uh, consider it. Ask your employer if they might be able to give you time off uh, to do that. There are some employers that will do that. Um, so thank you uh, for helping us find that information, Philip. And then uh, during, uh, I know that we you covered it um, in your presentation, but if we could just do like really quick takeaways for people. Um, so there are like really run down quickly again, like the, the three ways to vote in New Jersey, the key dates that people need to know. Uh, so we just have that summarized again for everybody. Absolutely, yeah. So um, three ways to vote in New Jersey. Uh, you can vote in person on election day, November 8th, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. at your polling place. Traditional, easy. You can vote by mail, right? You can apply for a vote by mail ballot. Um, the deadline to receive your vote, uh, vote for your vote by mail ballot must be received, your application, I'm sorry, to be received by your county clerk by November 1st, 2022. If you are mailing it, um, if you're applying in person, that could be November 7th to receive your vote by mail ballot. And then uh, third and finally, um, you can vote early uh, at an early voting site in your county. Early voting dates start Saturday, October 29th to Sunday, November 6th, uh, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. weekdays and Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Sundays. Excellent. Uh, and did we talk about um, the last day that you're eligible to register to vote in the elections is November? Yes. Uh, great point. Thanks for the reminder. October yeah. 18th. So that's 21 days prior to the election, October 18th, register to vote before October 18th. Um, that is the deadline. And hopefully that will change if we can get our same day bill passed. But uh, for now, 21 days before the election. So October 18th. Uh, exactly. Other questions uh, for Phil while we uh, while I'm waiting. Uh, I do have a, a couple of more in my hopper. Um, I remember, I, I don't think we've talked about it today. I, I remember, and I'm sure many people remember the election a couple of years ago in the middle of COVID, we had all that talk about drop boxes and there were drop boxes in different county locations, some more than others. Uh, are, are drop boxes to return mail uh, by mail uh, ballots going to be available this year? Yes, absolutely. So, um... When it comes to vote by mail, you can obviously just mail it off. <laughs> uh, you can return it in person and you can also put it in a secure ballot drop box. Um, the vote by mail law that was passed um, back, uh, back back in 2020 has a requirement. You know, each, each county has to have, I believe it's 10 drop boxes at least. They can obviously have more. So um, you can go onto the a Department of State's website, find the location for your nearest Dropbox, drop it off. Um, those Dropbox sites are, you know, safe and secure, um, uh, CCTV, um, and something that we recommend people use, uh, especially if you're getting right up to the deadline and you're worried about it, you know, getting stuck in the mail, you know, just drop it in a Dropbox. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, I also remember in the last election, uh, I, I can't remember the exact terminology. It's when people are bringing um, mail or um, or or um, or otherwise um, absentee ballots in on behalf of other people. Do they call it bearers? Is that what it's called? Bearers. That's right. Yeah. And are there bearer restrictions uh, in this election that people need to know about? 
Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. Um, the, the laws haven't changed on that, um, but it, it, it's worth refreshing people, reminding people. So um, you can bring uh, someone else's, um, so for example, uh, an elderly relative, they have a vote by mail envelope. You are, are going to come and actually take it for them and drop it in the mailbox. You become a ballot bearer. Um, so you have to fill out the ballot bearer form, uh, certify um, that you were the person who you know, conferred the ballot on their behalf. Uh, the restrictions in New Jersey are you can only be a ballot bearer for up to up to three other people. Um, up to three, okay. Up to three. Yeah. So good to know. Um, those are those are the rules that we have. Um, so uh, if there's conspiracy theories out, out there about people bring lots of ballots, uh, no, not true. Great. Um, I did have another question. I'm I'm just full of them. Uh, but my brain just blanked out. I'm looking at my notes to see if I can figure out what it is. Um, we talked that we did last day to register to vote. We did poll workers. We did bearers. Oh, I remember. Um, you know, you talked about, uh, obviously, we talked at length about some of the new measures that have passed recently. And we know that same day uh, is up for um, a hearing, hopefully soon. And also, uh, you had mentioned the uh, the pay to play bill. Are there any other efforts in New Jersey pending legislation that may be harmful that people need to know about that they can advocate against? Like I know there have been states that are restricting access. You know, saying that there only needs to be one per county in that in that state. Um, is there anything like that going on in New Jersey that people need to be aware of? So um, at this time, I think the, you know, the, the, the primary bill that we're concerned with, you know, is this, you know, uh, campaign finance bill. Um, I think that the, um, as of right now, you know, we, we, we had some concerns with some of those, the bills that we talked about. And, and, and so we're lobbying on some of those. There's no sort of like new election bills that I would flag for people as of particular concern. Um, the, um, the fact that we still have same day voter registration, you know, not, not posted for a vote in the Senate. So contact your, um, lattice leaders about your support for same day voter registration and, and contact them, uh, about, um, the, 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 the pay to play bill and, 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 and concerns you may have about that legislation as well. Great. Thank you again. Uh, you know, I guess it's a good thing that some of these draconian efforts that are underway in other states aren't underway here in New Jersey. <laughs> so right. uh, that's, you know, that's one of the positives we have about being here. Um, Razia has a question. Uh, she asks where you can get access to ballot barrier forms. Right, so basically um, all you have to do is, you know, sign the, like the, 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 the bearer portion of the outer envelope of the ballot. So you have, you know, a vote by mail ballot that someone's requested, and there's a uh, the, the the form is right on there. Sorry if I was a little bit less uh, than clear about that. Um, basically, there's a little portion of the form. You sign it in the presence of the person whose ballot it is, um, and certify yes, I'm 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 going to be um, sign signing on here as as the bearer for your ballot. If you're hand delivering the ballot to the county board of elections, you should know that you will ask the guests to show ID and sign. They will have like a, a book of like ballot bearers. So that's the other thing that you would need to do. Um, so that's also something to do, but it's pretty straightforward. Just sign the, the portion on the ballot and, and, and bring it in. Thank you. And it looks like Razia says thank you. So I guess we've answered her question. Uh, thanks for uh, chiming in Razia and asking that. Um, that does bring, forward one other question. I, I, I'm full of them apparently today. Uh, another question, um, not in your presentation. And again, I apologize if it's not something you can answer on the spot. Um, what if people are experiencing barriers to being able to vote? So um, individuals who have a disability that may have a polling place that is inaccessible for some reason, uh, or if there are, are presence of um, you know people trying to defer uh, deter you, I should say, deter you from voting uh, in front of a polling location. Uh, where can people report that information? Yes, yeah, so this is uh, a great um, 
a great question. Um, I would say that the first place to go, um, especially for you know uh, election day concerns, is the election protection hotline, which is eight six six hour vote. Um, that's eight six 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 eight seven eight six three eight. But you know eight six six hour vote. Um, they have yeah English, Spanish, Asian languages um, staffed by you know volunteers and election lawyers who can address um, and you know deploy help, especially for, you know, things that are happening on election day at your locations, but, you know, at any time during the uh, election process, that's the election protection hotline, uh, call it, make use of it for, you know, like more structural things, like, you know, if, if a particular polling place isn't accessible and it isn't meeting accessibility standards, um, you know, I think it's still worth calling just to flag that as a location that needs, that is, is of concern. Um, so that it's in the system. And I, I would also say, you know, contact, contact us, contact the League of Women Voters, um, because, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, if there's particular places that are you know, of persistent concern and not accessible, uh, we, we want to know about that. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thank you so much for all that information, Philip. This has been really fantastic. Uh, before we end a little early, uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, if so, you can raise your Zoom hand or put them in the chat so we can just give another another few moments uh, just to see if other questions trickle in. Uh, but again, while we're waiting, uh, Philip, thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, again, remember to contact your legislators and ask them to support the same day registration voter bill and to uh, oppose the campaign finance bill as it's currently written. Uh, when uh, NASW New Jersey receives advocacy updates from the League of Women Voters, uh, we will try to uh, amplify those calls and send those out to you as well, uh, that you can uh, easily respond to your legislators on these issues. Uh, I don't see any other calls going in, so the best news of the day is that we all get 10 minutes of our lives back to maybe enjoy an extra long lunch today. Um, so we'll end a little bit early. And uh, Philip, again, thank you so much for being here. We really value your partnership at the League and the work that you all do. And uh, and thanks again for being with us today. Thanks so much, Jeff. Appreciate the opportunity and uh, all the great questions. All right. Take care, everyone. We'll see you on our next community conversation.